Hello and welcome. With this year's changes to the tax code, OJM Group reminds investors to consider the tax impact of their investment decisions. In this month's on-demand webinar, OJM Wealth Advisor Andrew Taylor, CFP, outlined six strategies to reduce taxes on investments and enhance overall portfolio performance. It's important to note that this video is for informational purposes only and the information may not be suitable for your personal circumstances. Please contact a professional before attempting to execute any of these strategies. If you find this information helpful, we would encourage you to check out one of our books, including our newest book, Wealth Management Made Simple. Topics include investment terminology, market history, tips for choosing an advisor, and more. At the end of the webinar, we'll discuss how you can get a free ebook download or hard copy of Wealth Management Made Simple or any of our other books. Um, to get started, I would like to set proper context as to why minimizing taxes are important. Uh, let's take a look at some historical data. Now, you're looking at 90 years of historical returns, uh, both post-tax and pre-tax uh, returns of asset classes are side by side. Uh, clearly, you can see the impact that uh, stock returns have been reduced by roughly 2% uh, over the last 90 years, accounting for taxes, bonds. Um, the impact is, is just as significant. Um, your return drops from 55 to 3.5%. Now let's take a look at um, the impact of, of the combination of taxes and inflation on net returns. So the performance number that's that's stated here uh, is also referred as a real net return on assets. Uh, you'll note that the actual real net return of treasury bills is negative um, since 1926 or over a 90 year period. Now, I will address the new tax rates for 2018 in a moment, but let's take a moment to um, review the tax changes that took place five short years ago. Uh, these changes had a significant impact on investment returns. Um, the top ordinary income rate increased from 35% to 43.4, which is a 24% increase. Um, you know, this impacted both fixed income returns as well as short-term capital gains as it relates to investments. And the top capital gains rate uh, increased from 15% to 23.8 for those in the top bracket, which equates to a 58.6% bump. Um, now this would apply to qualified dividends and long-term capital gains. Now, if we take a look, um, you know, at the, essentially this is the historical spread between the top and the lowest marginal tax rate. And now you may be surprised to note that taxes today are actually on the lower side of what we would call historical norms. Now the new tax rates for 2018, and these are scheduled to uh, last until 2025. Um, so I won't read all of this to you, but if you note the tax, the, the two top tax rates, uh, if your income is over 200,000, but less than 500,000, if you are a single filer, um, you know, then your tax rate um, is 35%, and those with ho with household income or taxable income over 500k uh, would be subject to a 37% tax rate. Uh, if you're married, filing a joint return, uh, if your income's between 400 and 600,000, uh, you're well, you fall in a 35% tax rate, and if you're over 600K, um, you're, you are in a 37% marginal tax rate. So let's move on to the reason that you tuned in today, uh, to specific techniques to reduce your investment tax bill. Number one, take advantage of account registration. Uh, you can utilize um, ETFs in taxable accounts and in individual stocks, uh, the accounts that are least tax efficient, you want the investment products that are the most tax efficient. Um, actively manage mutual funds and bond funds, ideally you'll hold those in tax deferred accounts, the, the account registrations that you are not subject to tax until you begin taking distributions. Uh, in, some accounts are actually tax-free. 
Uh, you do want to own municipal bonds in taxable accounts. We'll take a moment to go through uh, tax-free rates um, versus ordinary income rates and how to calculate your tax equivalent return on a municipal bond and walk you through break-even points. You should always be aware of the holding period of your securities prior to entering a sell order. So the long-term capital gains rate again is 23.8 if you're in the highest bracket versus 40.8 um, for short-term capital gains. So in many cases, waiting an extra you know two weeks, six weeks can make a very big difference, uh, and it should be a factor in your your ultimate sell decision. Uh, recognize that you can offset gains by realizing losses. We'll walk you through a, 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 a real-life example, a case study where we had a client with $3 million in assets. They had significant gains that year. We were able to realize losses in an asset class, um, you know, which ultimately that did not perform well in that particular calendar year, um, resulting in a savings of over $7,000 for that client. Think twice about giving gifting cash. We'll explain the reason for that shortly and understand your fund's tax cost ratio. Now, this is likely a new term that you are not familiar with. I'll take a moment to explain that term and it, the impact uh, of tax cost ratio on your portfolio. First, account registration matters. So the typical investor understands the benefit of security diversification. It, limit, it minimizes risk. It limits volatility in the portfolio. However, a tax diversi diversification strategy is not something the average investor is familiar with. Ideally, you diversify across three different account registrations. So you begin with your brokerage accounts. This could be, you know, an individual account, a joint account, LLC, a trust account. Uh, you're, you have an annual tax liability in these types of accounts. So the underlying holdings within those accounts should be tax efficient. Any dividends that you accumulate will be taxed in that year. Um, if you have capital gains, if you have traded uh, in the account, any gains in excess of your cost basis, you're going to be subject to paying taxes to on a, a form called a Schedule D. Um, now, the benefit of these brokerage accounts, the reason why you, you do want to have them and you want to diversify, the tax is what I would call moderate. In the distribution phase of your life cycle, capital gains taxes, that being long-term capital gains, uh, are more favorable than ordinary income rates. Qualified plans and traditional IRAs. Uh, now, these accounts grow tax deferred, so you know the tax efficiency of the underlying investments in these accounts is simply not relevant. As a result, uh, you want to own uh, le the least efficient vehicles. Um, you know, bonds are an example. Mutual funds that have a high rate of turnover uh, are also an appropriate holding for um, you know for IRA accounts. Now, the downside of the qualified plans and the traditional IRAs, you are subject to um, typically the highest tax rate. So, you are, distributions are taxed at your ordinary income rate, which again have been historically higher uh, and substantially higher in, in most cases throughout history when compared to capital gains rates. And then finally, we have the Roth IRA. Um, and the Roth IRAs, uh, they do have the potential for tax-free growth, provided you meet all the, uh, the requirements prior, prior to taking a distribution. Now, the downside of Roth IRAs, there are limitations um, on funding. Now, there are certain strategy, it, it, limitations being income limitations um, and also uh, the annual contributions that you can make to an IRA today. That number's 5,500 if you're under 50 years old. Uh, you're capped at 6,500 if you are uh, 50 or older with earned income. Now, there are strategies to get dollars into a Roth IRA if you are a high earner. Um, you can perform Roth conversions um, of, of a traditional IRA. There are backdoor strategies. Um, you, the details behind that is beyond the scope of, of this webinar, uh, but I think all three of these um, account registrations are important to be aware of so that you can plan uh, appropriately to minimize taxes in the long term. Uh, next strategy, consider municipal bonds in taxable accounts. Oh, if you're not familiar with municipal bonds, they are exempt from federal taxation. Um, and then 
Also, you do want to understand your tax equivalent yield. Now, how do you calculate that? What does that mean to you? Well, if you if you are in the highest tax bracket, a 3% yield is actually higher uh, than 5%. So doesn't necessarily sound logical, but I'm going to take a moment to walk you through why and how you you make that tax equivalent yield um, calculation. So a corporate bond, which would be taxable to you, again, if you are in the highest tax bracket, which is the equivalent of 40.8%, if you invest 100000 you essentially earn 5000 in interest. But once you factor in the tax rate, which, you know, you take one divided or minus 0 0.408, which again essentially is 40.8 percent. What do you keep? Uh, it's $2,960. Now, a tax exempt municipal bond, again, not subject to federal taxes. Uh, you take $100,000.03, $3,000 in interest earned. Obviously, $3,000 is more than $2,960. So it's one of those unique cases where 3 percent is actually more than 5 percent. Uh, but if you take a note of this formula, I mean, you can run the math uh, for uh, for an analysis, municipal versus um, taxable, and determine what your break-even point may be. Be aware of your holding period. Um, Long-term capital gains are obviously very favorable relative to short-term capital gains, and uh, today's tax law defines long-term as 12 months. So again, we've referenced the 23.8 versus 40.8 rates uh, and the, the, the difference between the two. So if you do wait you know, an extra month or two months, um, can end up saving you thousands of dollars. Now, I will state that you don't want taxes to influence your investment decisions. Um, you know, that being said, if you're if you're a short period of time from uh, reaching that 12 month threshold, it can certainly make sense um, you know, to delay your trade. For a period of time, you know, a quick example: a hundred thousand dollar investment with five hundred thousand in capital gains. You know, if you have fifty thousand in short-term capital gains, you know the taxes due. Again, this is assuming you're in the highest rate, twenty thousand four hundred. And by waiting a short period of time, fifty thousand in long-term capital gains results in eleven thousand nine hundred in taxes. Ultimately, the savings to you in this scenario would be eighty-five hundred dollars. Proactively realize losses to offset gains. Now, the, by diversifying your investment strategy across multiple asset classes, uh, what that has done over the years is it's created a planning opportunity. So U.S. equities have thrived essentially since the financial crisis. Uh, foreign stocks have had periods where they haven't performed well. Uh, we've seen, seen the same with commodities, uh, bonds, you know, since the, um, uh, the election last year have faced periods where they've struggled. We've seen the Fed aggressively increase interest rates. It puts some pressure on bond prices. So you may be experiencing losses in your bond portfolio. Um, now you do need to understand um, the wash rules to avoid a disallowance if you liquidate a security to attempt to claim a loss and buy that same security within a period of 30 days, you could have your loss uh, disallowed. The rules can be somewhat complicated, so I would advise that you speak to your, your financial advisor or a tax advisor uh, before taking action on this strategy. But the best way to learn is to uh, take a look at a, <clears throat> a quick example. I mean, in the client that I referenced a few minutes ago, three million dollar brokerage account had one hundred ninety four thousand in gains. Fifty thousand of those gains in this particular account were realized gains. Um, what we were able to do is perform a tax swap of international equities. Uh, was a thirty thousand dollar loss in that particular position uh, it ultimately saved the client over seven thousand dollars so again a, a planning opportunity that resulted in savings that most would suggest are, are substantial think twice about gifting cash now we're not discouraging you know having charitable intentions we're actually encouraging you to reassess your approach and how you you donate to a charitable organization um, so if you are successful investing, you likely have um, substantial capital gains. If you've been investing for you know, a significant period of time, you've benefited from the growth in the equities market post-financial crisis. Um, so what's a strategy you can implement to 
to eliminate a, what, what I would call a future tax liability. Let's say you have the intentions of donating fifty thousand to a qualified charity. Um, you had a twenty thousand dollar investment that ultimately appreciated to fifty thousand. What do you have? A thirty thousand dollar capital gain, which means that you have a future tax liability of more than seven thousand dollars. Now, again, this is assuming you're in the top um, tax bracket, the top capital gains rate of twenty three eight. Now. A qualified charity is not subject to paying capital tax, capital gains taxes. So the you know the fifty thousand dollar gift to them, it, it net of taxes, it's not really an issue. So if you were to deposit fifty thousand into your brokerage account, replacing the 50,000 in appreciated securities that you had gifted to the charity, uh, you know, the net benefit to you obviously is the $7,000, as opposed to just writing a check directly to the charity. So essentially you wash your hands of a $7,000 future tax liability, net impact to the charity is identical. They receive their 50,000. And finally, tax cost ratio. So what actually is tax cost ratio? What, what it does is it measures a fund's annualized return. Uh, what percentage of the fund's annualized return is actually reduced by the taxes investors pay on distributions? Well, what, is that, what does that even mean? Mutual funds regularly distribute stock dividends, bond interest and capital gains to their shareholders. They must do this to receive specialized, specialized tax treatment. Now there is even the possibility that you could experience a taxable distribution when investing in a fund in a year where the fund has actually lost money. So it is very important for you to pay attention to this number. Uh, generally a tax cost ratio on a fund is gonna range anywhere from you know zero to as high as 5%. The higher the number, the less tax efficient uh, that the fund would be. Now, how does this impact returns? Think of it as um, the impact being similar to the expense ratio of a mutual fund or a management fee. So it, it reduces investment returns, uh, you know, dollar for dollar essentially. Now, it, it, tax cost ratio is not assuming a liquidation of the security. It's just assessing uh, the impact of the turnover within the fund every year, and then um, you know the distributions that have to take place and are sent to you. So obviously the fund can distribute long-term and short-term capital gains. The data that you see when you're looking at a tax cost ratio typically assumes that you're going to be in the highest federal tax bracket. So this is information that's available for Morningstar. It's in your custodian uh, may very well provide this information on their the research section of their website. But it is something that we're looking at uh, you know, very closely as an advisor of, of high net worth individual investors. Great way to explain this is, is walking you through um, another case study. So again, this is an example of the process that we go through when we're evaluating funds uh, for our clients. So we'll take a hypothetical investment, you know, the first fund, 15%, uh, nearly 16% three-year annual average return, but the cost ratio is a whopping 6.51%. So 100,000 in three years, you know, Gross return fund grew to 155,000 essentially. Um, the net return uh, would equate to roughly 130,000. So the return loss to taxes in this scenario because of the tax cost ratio of the fund, $24,700. Now we evaluate hypothetic, hypothetical investment number two, same exact three-year averaging return, but a cost ratio of 0.39%. You can imagine the second option is an ETF, an exchange-traded fund with very low turnover. So that $100,000 investment obviously grew at the same rate, roughly $155,000. Uh, three years, the net return of that $100,000 after taxes is $153,360. Uh, the return loss to taxes is uh, less than $1,600. So the difference between the two, $23,143. And that is your tax savings over a three-year period. 
So you can see uh, evaluating tax cost ratio, it can make a big difference. Now, typically you don't see a six and a half percent tax cost ratio on the fund. So we'll acknowledge this is an extreme example. But when you think of the impact of a, a lower cost ratio over one's investing life cycle, we're talking about compounding and, you know, 30, 40 years and beyond, uh, the difference can be quite substantial. So these examples I ran through, I mean, why are they not standard practices for every advisor? Uh, there's, there's several reasons. Um, most cases, and the number one reason, it's not applicable. Uh, most of the assets invested in the market are actually in tax advantage accounts. So they're in pensions, they're in endowments, they're in 401ks, they're in IRAs. Uh, turnover is, is frankly irrelevant as a result. Um, you know, tax sensitivity is, is not an issue. Uh, Number two, the typical client of an advisor is frankly not in the top, top tax bracket and um, they don't have significant assets in taxable accounts. If you take a look at the, the income data of all filers in the United States, 225,000 in household income uh, would put you in the top 5% of all filers after deductions that individual is likely in a 28% tax bracket, which fits the profile of a, co of a corporate executive. Uh, very few uh, taxpayers are in a 40.8% tax bracket. Uh, number three, financial advice, unfortunately, is often product-driven and it's not client-driven. Now, this gets into uh, the, the whole separate discussion about fiduciary standard versus uh, suitability standard for investors. Some of the products that are out there are created for efficiency. They're great for scalability, but they're not necessarily great for affluent investors. You know, examples of these are SMAs. These are separately managed accounts uh, of individual equities, which often tend to have very high turnover. Uh, as an investor, an affluent investor, you're going to be looking at a significant tax liability with SMAs in many cases. Um, Another reason, revenue sharing arrangements with mutual funds, so a, um, a, a custodian or uh, a, a wirehouse that also creates products uh, is very often getting compensated or getting paid by those underlying products, uh, which can, again, create a tremendous conflict of interest uh, and a less tax favorable situation for a high net worth investor. And the fourth reason, um, you know, it's time consuming. I mean, it's time consuming for the advisor to take the time to explain um, the benefit of net returns. And uh, as a investor, you're probably guilty of this, and, and we all are. We are just concerned with the bottom line. We look at the percentage return on our website or on a uh, on a statement. Uh, we don't take a step back and say, oh, well, what what kind of job did my advisor do in maximizing my net return? You know, did they minimize taxes? Okay. That, that example that I gave with the municipal bond where 3% ultimately is more than five. Well, if you're just looking at a simple performance number, 3% doesn't sound so good, but it also doesn't tell the full story. You know, it matters what you keep, not necessarily what your gross return is. The net return ultimately uh, is what, impacts the the overall success of your retirement planning and a successful tax management investment strategy. So that concludes the core of uh, the content for our presentation today. Um, we'll take a, a moment to explain how you can get a free book from OJM Group. OJM is a multidisciplinary wealth management firm and we've worked with over a thousand clients throughout the country. We work in three different divisions for our clients, investment management, consulting, and insurance benefits. We would welcome the opportunity to speak with you about how we might be able to bring value to your wealth planning. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, our principals have authored several books, all of which are available to webinar viewers at no charge. You can get a free hard copy or ebook download for Kindle or iPad by texting OJMWeb to 555-888. You can also visit ojmbookstore.com and enter the code OJMWeb at checkout. In addition to a free book, OJM Group also offers webinar viewers a complimentary consultation where we can answer questions and see if our firm might be a good fit for your situation. Visit ojmgroup.com or call 877-656-4362 
to schedule your free consultation. Enjoy the free copies of our books, and we hope to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks for watching.